Mark Cuban is balancing on a knife's edge. He's not rich yet, but he has a shot at making it big, really big. He's pitching the sale of his company, Broadcast.com. Having started out with only a few buddies, this company has been everything for Mark in the past few years. Over the past year, his company has exploded in popularity and profits. But now, there's danger looming on the horizon. The dot-com bubble. The internet was growing like crazy for the past decade and with it tech company stocks have skyrocketed. But now speculators believe the technology isn't advancing at the pace of their investments. Key investors begin to pull out. Getting the timing right is the difference between selling for billions or pennies. Cuban needs to cash out on the massive success of broadcast.com or risk losing practically everything. He wants to join the BBC. I will never forget talking to Mark about, you know, where are you going with this broadcast thing? And he goes, I'm going to the BBC, Billionaire Boys Club. Cuban has relentlessly drummed up hype and publicity for broadcast in the past four months, but buyers are hesitant to meet his offer. The cards are stacked against him. Will Mark be able to lure investors into a doomed deal? Let's rewind a little. It's the 1950s and America is booming. It's a time of business, opportunity and growth. It's the age of the American dream. Against this backdrop, Mark Cuban is born into a second generation Jewish immigrant family in the Mount Lebanon suburb of Pittsburgh. His grandparents changed their last name from Chabaniski to Cuban to sound more American. His father furnishes cars and his mother hops between jobs every week. So pretty humble baby silverback beginnings. Similar to the booming business opportunities that characterize the 1950s, Mark Cuban is entrepreneurial from a young age. At this time, many young Americans are finding ways to make some side money, just as we do in the Giga University. But Cuban is different. He loves sports. And his favorite sport? basketball. There's just one problem. He can't keep playing on the court with torn up shoes and get bullied by his friends. At first, Cuban asks his parents for a new pair of basketball shoes. But coming from a blue collar family, these kind of expenses are difficult. The solution? Mark Cuban gets to work. He starts all sorts of ventures. First, from anything he can get his hands on baseball cards and garbage bags. I always knew I was into business. I mean, I started my first businesses when I was 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. Well, well, hold on. What were you doing at 9 and 10? At 9, I was buying and selling baseball cards. At the age of 12, he starts his first business, selling garbage bags around his neighborhood. At 14, he starts a stamp collecting company. I started a stamp company. I started with a quarter and bought a stamp and left with $50, thinking, Hey, if I could do this, I could do anything. As soon as he can afford it, Cuban buys a pair of expensive basketball shoes. For Cuban, nothing matches the thrill of building a business from scratch. He succeeds because he does things his own way and never takes no for an answer. He enrolls in Kelly School of Business simply because they have the most affordable tuition. While at university, Cuban takes what he learns in class and puts it into practice. He teaches disco, runs a chain letter and as one of his first major ventures decides to open a bar near his university. In my over 35 years of teaching, I've never had a student really start a business while they were an undergrad or an MBA here on campus. And he started Motley's, which became by far, I think, the best bar in town. While his first business eventually closes, Cuban now has a wealth of experience and connections that he can leverage in the future. One of his most important connections, however, is with an assistant. Although seemingly unimportant, Mark finding a personal assistant changes everything. He's at the start of his career, so there is a lot of things a personal assistant can do. How about letting your assistant build your personal brand online. They can help you with creating a website, developing a social media presence, growing your followers by interacting with other social media profiles and industry leaders. Or even better, let your assistant help with job search and applications. They can help you by identifying job openings, customizing your resume and cover letter and submitting applications on your behalf. Lastly, why not have your assistant help you with networking? 
networking and mentorship tasks such as identifying potential mentors and networking events, scheduling meetings and following up with contacts. Of course I am kidding about Mark Cuban, but these are some examples of how I have used a personal assistant by Wing in the past. Yes, you do pay money for an assistant, but if you give them the right tasks, your return on investment will be massive. If you manage to build a social media presence that's worth tens of thousands of dollars and if you find a better job or a great mentor through your assistant's outreach and activities that's worth hundreds of thousands. Click the link in the description below and the best part you get $100 off on your first part-time assistant and $200 off on your first full-time assistant. So what are you waiting for? Sign up now and save time and money. He gets a job with Mellon Bank immediately after graduating in 1981. Cuban still has a long way to go before he can become a shark in his own right. But the next chapter in his life is the reason why he's a household name for success today. Wanting a change of scenery, in 1982 Cuban moves to Dallas, Texas. He works as a salesperson at Your Business Software, one of the earliest software sellers in Texas. Cuban is an electrifying salesman, always going above and beyond. One morning he takes the time to meet with a client to secure more business instead of opening up the store. I mean, can you blame him? Apparently Your Business Software can. The boss doesn't like Cuban doing things his own way and he's fired less than a year into the job. Cuban decides to take the perfect revenge. Mark Cuban starts his own company, Microsolutions, an open declaration of war against your business software. The company is one of the earliest resellers of software to newly modernizing businesses across America. After growing Microsolutions to more than $30 million in revenue, he sells it to CompuServe. The price? Six million in 1992. And I retired. And you retired. And what yeah. did you do with that money? Your biggest purchase? My biggest purchase, I um, bought a lifetime pass on American Airlines and I had one mission in mind. I, I wanted to be Party. able to go to as many countries <laughs> around the world as I could and get drunk with as many people as I possibly could. Cuban is ready to party, but a college buddy of his, Todd Wagner, approaches him with an offer he can't refuse. Wagner's proposal is simple. People want to watch their favorite sports teams, but they can oftentimes be busy or away during matches. Why not use the internet to broadcast footage from sports matches live? He calls it AudioNet and Cuban is fully on board. Wagner and Cuban's mutual love for college football and other sports results in the creation of one of the first mass broadcasting platforms available on the internet. He sat me down, he said, look, I've got this idea where I think we can listen to Indiana basketball sporting events, you know, anywhere in the world by using the internet. Think of it like an early form of Twitch, where people can watch live streams of television from anywhere, no matter where they are in the world. Except, well, without all the pointless drama. Seems simple now, but at the time broadcast.com is revolutionary. All of a sudden we're gonna start setting new habits, where instead of just turning on the TV or waiting to get home to watch the TV, you're gonna immediately go to a website like broadcast.com, knowing you're gonna be able to get an unedited version of the video the minute that it's available. In 1998, the dynamic duo of Cuban and Wagner renamed the company to Broadcast.com and prepared to go public with an IPO of $18 a share. The stock closed at $62.75. At the time, it set a record for the highest percentage increase on an opening day. With an over 344% increase from their IPO on the opening day, Cuban is a record-breaking success. And with it, Mark Cuban becomes a household name. He's humble enough to recognize the role of luck in business success. I happen to, to have a company, Broadcast.com, that went public at the right time when the internet stock market was going nuts. But he's not a billionaire yet. Mark Cuban is having fun making millions, but he knows when it's time to pull out. The golden age of the early internet is not going to last forever. Everybody thought they could get rich quick. Everybody across from retail investor to investment bank, they had this period where money was growing on trees. Better to cash out while broadcast.com is still at its peak. But Cuban wants to go out with a bang. So it's time for the streaming event of the century. 
For the 1999 Super Bowl, Broadcast.com handles a special deal to show an advertisement for Victoria's Secret. That's right, Broadcast.com received worldwide popularity because of hosting a Victoria's Secret ad. This stunt gains them an unprecedented 2 million viewers. Seems like nothing today, but in 1999, when most people are using dial-up internet, this breaks records. This is exactly the type of publicity Cuban needs to put his company on the map and it works spectacularly well. It just so happens that at this time Yahoo is looking for a way to get their edge over fast rising competitors like Google. Due to the recent ascent of Broadcast.com, Cuban strikes an exceptionally lucrative deal, selling the company for an unheard of 5.7 billion dollars. Cuban has now reached his dream, he is in the billionaire boys club. Ironically however, Broadcast.com's popularity plummets after the Share. Why did Yahoo buy it and what did they do with it afterwards? Right. Now, did Yahoo screw it up? Hell yeah, they did, right? They, when the stock um, bubble burst and their board said, we just got to cut everything. So they cut everything they had, you know, except for the basics and screwed it up bad. It is the end of an era. Now, an even bigger challenge awaits Mark Cuban. Having dominated in the business world, Mark seeks a new arena to compete in, or more accurately, a new court. Cuban now turns his attention to the only thing he loves more than business, ice bathing with Kevin Hart. <laughs> No, not really, it's basketball. In 2000, he acquires a majority stake in his favorite team, the Dallas Mavericks. At this point in time, they are the worst team in the entire NBA, maybe even the WNBA. But Cuban is ready to push his new team to real wins. You've got to start giving these guys who have been in damaged programs, let's call them, the thought process that they can win that they are expected to win. New owner, new changes. Cuban quickly tears up everything to make the necessary changes to win. Cuban owns this team and he wants to show it. Most team owners sit in the fancy private seating to watch the games, but Mark Cuban is there courtside every single match. And he does not mince words. No, NBA control at the timeout. NBA control at the timeout. My job is to, to stand up for my, for my guys and if I think something's wrong, I'm gonna do something about it. He's even fined 500,000 US dollars because of his angry comments. Your trash talking was so good, you actually dropped an F-bomb uh, before the game here when I interviewed you. And so I've just been informed that you've actually been fined $15,000. Uh, and it's it's okay though because it's going to a good cause. It's going to Cyber Smile. Do you take back the F bomb or you you're standing by it? So if I say it again, I have to pay another 15k. Hey, okay, you want to up it to 30,000? Fuck it. But this hands-on approach pays off. In 2001, for the first time in over 10 years, the Dallas Mavericks make it to the playoffs. Not to mention, with a world-famous billionaire like Cuban attending the games, the Mavericks become a sensation. The team's value jumps by over 50 million dollars and match attendance goes up 35%. But they haven't quite won yet. 2006, while momentum is on their side, the Mavericks push with a two-game lead against the Miami Heat. But in in the last moment, they choke and let the heats get ahead. The shark is not having it. When he was pissed, he may as well have been Satan. The players literally ran the other way in the locker room. Recognizing the need for a change in strategy, just four years later, Cuban reshuffles the deck. He hires a new coach, drafts star players, and makes the players train harder. All this while Cuban is undergoing a legal case by the US government on allegations of insider trading. Finally, after making it to the finals in the 2011 season, the Dallas Mavericks seize victory against the Miami Heat, becoming the champions Mark Cuban always dreamed of. And all of a sudden this chant broke out, thank you Mark, thank you Mark, thank you Mark. How many times have you heard of a building chanting thank you to the owner? 
that's pretty unique. Cuban has disrupted industries no one else can, like buying a failing basketball team and transforming it into one of the best in the NBA, making $211 million a year just from owning the Dallas Mavericks. For Cuban, it's all about speed and effectiveness. He dresses casually and speaks his mind, not something expected from the typical billionaire. You just have to go out there and do the work. And if people do the work, you know, maybe they're rough around the edges. You can work on that side a lot easier than you can work on people who just aren't motivated to do the work. Cuban is a shark for a reason, because he's driven, alert and ready to seize an opportunity when it comes. But Cuban is also careful in evaluating how good opportunities actually are. And what better example of this than Shark Tank? It's the show where aspiring entrepreneurs get to pitch their ideas and compete for funding from a panel of wealthy business sharks. Cuban has never been shy to express his opinions on what he thinks of a pitch. Our, You're investing that's in high air. fiber. Right, it's nonsense, Robert. It's all nonsense across the board. You're no. such a, a con artist. How could you guys be so gullible? The show is a genius bid to direct more attention to Cuban and the other sharks, all while acquiring more talent through TV drama. Cuban even debuts in Sharknado 3 as the American president. Not to mention, Cuban even temporarily allowed fans to use Dogecoin to buy official Dallas Mavericks merchandise. Oh, and he also owns a 77-acre town of Mustang in Texas, because a buddy needed to sell it. But these are a sideshow compared to Shark Tank. Even with his reputation for not watching his language, Cuban puts his money where his mouth is and always lives up to his word, even though he's not without controversy. Mark Cuban, not the smartest guy, in my opinion. Just like one of these intense dudes that's not just not that smart. Really intense. Busted moves on Dancing with the Stars. But now, Cuban is walking into a different court in Texas as he faces federal insider trading charges. Nevertheless, Cuban shines with an incredible work ethic, an incredible basketball comeback story, and interesting side ventures like his cost plus drugs. We literally can change the game for, for medications and that's what we did with costplusdrugs.com. Love him or hate him, Mark goes against the grain. He doesn't look like your typical billionaire. He doesn't speak like one and he doesn't act like one either because none of that matters in the pursuit of rich so what does? So it's, it's understanding what your skill set is, finding the right place to use those skills, and then going for it. 